Shown here are experimental data collected in one of a simple in-class experiment. We had seven different objects, all with cylindrical shapes, and students took turns to measure the diameter as well as the corresponding circumference of each of the seven objects and tabulate their data. And we are going to use this example to demonstrate two things. First, simply how to nicely present or most effectively present your experimental data with error bars. And the second thing we want to demonstrate is how you can fit your experimental data to a theoretical model or a mathematical equation uh, and then get important information. So first thing, we have done the measurements and we simply want to present that measurements. We want to say, what is the diameter that we determined for object one and what is the corresponding circumference? So for that, we're going to plot the average data. So we're going to set up an average value here and then we're going to have the diameter and circumference. Therefore, this equals to, we're going to just call in the building itself function takes the three measurements of the diameter as the argument and then we're just going to copy and paste for both columns. So these are the data we're going to plot but we also know that these are not the true dimensions of our objects. As you can tell we did have deviations in the measurements and our plot should honestly represent that deviation in the measurements. So for that, we need to also calculate the standard deviation. So for standard deviation, we are again going to call the building function. So here we will have the stdev.p because we only have three measurements. Therefore, that's the entire population versus if we pick dot s, that means that we're taking a sample out of our total population. So the three input arguments. And then again, we can copy and paste. And we're going to use the standard deviation as the error in our plot. So to plot experimental data, especially when you have two variables that are dependent on each other, in this case, we can say that the circumference depends on the diameter of our object um, and their relation can be explained by a function. For this type of data plotting, the best practice, as far as I know, is to always use the scatter chart. And you can read about it, what scatter chart is best for. I do not recommend using scatter chart with line connecting the markers because uh, when you do that, in my opinion, you are implying information that you didn't have from your experiment, but you, you really didn't know the true behavior in this region. So I would recommend always use scatter chart without a line connection. So let's fill in the axis title. So here we have the diameter in the unit of centimeter. And here we have the circumference. in the unit of centimeter as well. And then we can give the chart a title. Let's just call it circumference. So C versus D plot to make it simple. So we have completed the basic plot for our data. We can clearly see how the circumference of the different object increases with the increasing diameter. Um, but now, as I said earlier, these data do not truly represent the dimensions uh, of our measurement because we did have variations in the measurement. And that needs to be represented by error bars. So from here, I'm going to click on this plus sign and then add error bars. 
So Excel would automatically add error bars for me, but those are not what I want. As you can see, they are the same for every data point, and that's not what I want. So I am going to click on first the horizontal error bar, and then I'm going to format error bar, as you can see here. So here you can see there are several options. I do want error bar to be extending in both directions instead of simply minus or simply plus. So I want to have both. And I do want to include the cap because it looks clearer. And then there are different options for the error amount. I can do a fixed value. So Excel simply pick a fixed value for me, or I can change that as well. I can do percentage. Do not click standard deviation. When you click standard deviation option here, what happens is Excel would calculate the standard deviation based on all the data points as if they are from the same sampling, which is not the case in this uh, example. So what we want is actually custom uh, uh, error bar because we have calculated the standard deviation, remember? So we're going to specify value. Um, in this case, for the horizontal error bar, I'm going to pick the standard deviation calculated for the diameter, because remember, horizontal, that's my diameter data. Same thing for the negative errors, OK? And then for the vertical error bars, I'm going to click on the error bars. And then over here, I can format that as well. Again, I want both directions. And I want to include cap. I don't want any of these amounts, but I want to do a custom specified value. So click this. For my vertical error bars, I'm going to use this set of data that I calculated earlier. That's the standard deviation in the circumference. Same thing for the negative value. Let me send it to its own chart. So as you can see, in my opinion, this is the best way to represent my experimental data because you can clearly see my measurements of, of the diameter as well as the circumference for each of the object. Um, but also the to include the error bar, that enables my uh, readers to understand that I did have errors in my measurements. For example, for this largest object here, from my experimental measurements, even though I can tell that the average circumference measured is 45.8 centimeter, I actually cannot tell what the true circumference of the object is. However, I can tell with confidence that its true circumference is between about 44 centimeter and 47 centimeter. It, it is within this range. So that is what the error bar implies. So the next thing I want to do is to fit the experimental data to a theoretical model. In this case, we have data for the diameter and the corresponding circumference. And we know that they are related. The relation is the circumference for a circle equals to pi multiplied by the diameter d. Therefore, we're going to try to determine uh, pi, the constant pi, from our experimental data. So how do we do that? So if you recall from pre-calculus, uh, what you've learned about the linear equation, um, for example, right here, y equals to mx plus b. This is a linear equation given in the slope-intercept form. And you have two variables, y and x. And if you plot your y data against the corresponding x data, you will get a straight line. And in this straight line, the slope is going to be this m here. And the b here is going to be the y-intercept. So coming back to our theoretical model, if we plot all of our circumference data against the corresponding diameter data, then we should get a straight line. We actually saw a straight line already. And the slope of that straight line should be pi, which is the ratio we're going to find from our experimental data. So when we do data fitting, um, rule of thumb is that more data you have, the better it is, the better fitting you will get. Therefore, 
we are actually not going to plot the average data. Remember, we're doing something different now. We're not representing the measurements anymore. We're trying to determine pi experimentally. Therefore, basically, we're just going to copy and paste all of our data together. And the order really doesn't matter. Because this relation, c equals to pi times d, should occur for every pair of my dc data. And also, if you compare this equation to what we saw earlier, y equals to m times x plus b, you can see that we should have a slope that is pi, but also we shouldn't have any intercept. Our intercept should be 0. Um, and as you can tell, this column corresponds to our x, which is our independent variable. And this column corresponds to my y variable, which is the dependent variable if you're thinking in terms of linear functions. So now I have my data ready. Let me select all of them and then select, insert my, again, scattered plot. So now I have this plot that contains all the data I have. Let me fix the axis titles real quick. And then to fit our experimental data to theoretical model, we're going to use trend line. You can either select the data and then right click, add trend line, or from here, you can also read trend line here. And then you can right click and then format it. Over here, as you can see, there are different options based on the behavior of your data. In our case, because we already know that the relation should be a linear relation, therefore we pick the linear trend line instead of the exponential logarithmic, etc., etc. Several other things, we do want to display equation, and we also want to display the R squared value. But in this case, we also want to set the intercept to be zero. Note that you don't do that necessarily for all the data fitting. However, in this case, because we already discussed this, according to our model, the intercept really should be zero. Therefore, we decide to set the intercept to be zero. Now, the plot is complete. My data has been fit automatically to a linear trend line. And the R square value is close to one. That indicates a very good fit. R square value being one indicates a perfect fit. And of course, if R squared value is very small, that indicates the fitting is not very reasonable. So the theoretical model probably cannot be used to explain your experimental observation. So from here, we have determined our pi value experimentally, which is 3.2784. And of course, it is not that close to the value that we already know, which is 3.14. However, it is close enough. Um, and if we improve our experimental conditions, if we improve our instrumentation and our own experimenting skills, we can definitely improve on this um, result. But that's how you use your experimental data to extract theoretical information based on a theoretical model.